This is episode 263 of the Stem Cell Podcast, ISSCR 2024, the global stem cell event, with doctors Amanda Clark, Agneta Kirkaby, and Malin Parmar. Hey, everybody. We are Dr. Daylon James and Dr. Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, please rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have three guests, Drs. Amanda Clark, Agna Tukurkaby, and Malin Parmar from the ISSCR, that's the International Society for Stem Cell Research for those uninitiated. They're on the podcast to talk about the upcoming annual meeting in Hamburg, Germany. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, you can still submit a late-breaking abstract to present at ISSCR 2024. The meeting is happening July 10th to 13th in Hamburg, Germany, and abstract submissions are due April 3rd. Learn more at ISSCR2024.org. All right, on to the roundup. But before we get there, I have some pretty devastating news for the stem cell research community and beyond Connie Eves, a giant in the stem cell community, uh, passed away recently. She was an icon as a scientist, uh, as an advocate and trailblazer in advancing women in science, uh, and as a member of the stem cell research community. Connie was also the guest on our special bicentennial episode, which ranks among my personal favorites. Yeah, it's such a devastating loss for the community. Um, Dr. Yves was just such a, an iconic figure in the field. And in addition to the amazing science that she had done for, for many decades in her laboratory, she had such a, um, a tremendous, you know, um, lineage of trainees that she produced as well. And some of those have been here on the show um, in various episodes in the past. So just a Really sad day for the stem cell community, and our thoughts are with the the Eves family at this time. Yeah, we're all feeling it. Such a huge impact on the community. We feel her loss, and we'll continue to. Back to the roundup. We got a call back to the ISSCR 2023 here with the story from Magdalena Zernica Goats, and this is employing those embryo models that you know she kicked off the meeting last year with, and caused quite a stir. Um, and I, I love this story because it really hits at, I think, the at the power uh, of these models to to answer questions that before now were really impenetrable. And, and this is really pertinent to, to my own field of study, which is human reproduction. You know, uh, many human pregnancies, a lot of them we don't even know about uh, end with failed implantation before, you know, you even know you're pregnant. Um, and that's because it's a really complex and orchestrated process, uh, in order to get beyond implantation, you need to coordinate three major lineages, the epiblast, which ends up becoming the embryo proper. We know about all the, the lineages there. Um, and then there's the two extra embryonic tissues, which are perhaps overlooked, uh, the trophectoderm that generates the placenta, that maternal fetal interface, and also perhaps most overlooked, the hypoblast. Uh, which forms the yolk sac. And, and it's the interaction between those two extra embryonic and, and embryo proper tissues that are really critical to multiple phases. Uh, first, implantation, but also the survival and patterning and beyond that, gastrulation of, of the embryo. Uh, and although we understand a, a lot of what's going on based on our mouse mostly models looking at these phases, peri implantation. Um, uh, there's a lot of differences between the human and mouse, as we learned from, like, for example, uh, germ cell specification, where it's just completely different circuits. Well, not completely, but some different elements that contribute to that process. Um, and in this case, uh, it's known from the mouse that there's the, the specification of a subset of that hypoblast. 
uh, into the anterior visceral endoderm is a conserved process across multiple uh, mammalian species. Uh, and in, in, in the mouse, what we know is that uh, there's uh, antagonists of BMP, Wnt, and nodal pathways that are secreted, um, and that protects the epiblast from formation of the primitive streak. Uh, in the mouse, that anterior visceral endoderm first appears in response to nodal signaling between the, the visceral endoderm and the epiblast, and also trophectoderm derived BMP signaling that, and this is key here, represses uh, AVE or anterior visceral endoderm specification. Um, so BMP plays a repressive role in this case. So in this study, as I said, from Magdalena Zernica Goat's lab, where it's shared between Cambridge and Caltech, what they did is use uh, human embryo models as well as uh, human embryos um, to investigate what the signaling was in terms of BMP and nodal signaling, also not signaling during this process. And what they found is that the hyperblast specification in the first place is similar to the mouse, uh, nodal dependent. But here's the key difference that while BMP is antagonistic, in the case of the mouse, you need BMP uh, for maintenance of that anterior vis visceral endoderm in the human system. Uh, beyond that, they also found another contrast in, in terms of the requirements for BMP signaling in maintenance of the epiblast between the human and mouse. And finally, they found that notch uh, uh, in a, like a three for one study here, looking at these three signaling pathways, found that notch was, uh, was critical for survival of the epiblast. So. You know, this, as I said at, at the out, outset, this is a story that I think illustrates the power of these embryo models to interrogate and elucidate some of the mechanisms underlying these fundamental processes that are, are important for implantation, right, and further development of embryos. Um, but I think the real shocker here is that things that we assumed uh, were conserved across all mammals, or at least I assumed, were concerned because there's such critical processes uh, and the, and the and like the shapes of the embryos and anatomical elements seem to be so similar. Um, and embryos look so alike uh, at these early stages. You assume that the the molecular pathways and transcription factors, signaling pathways, etc., would be conserved. But here we have a, a pretty pretty stark difference in the role of, of BMP between mouse and human. So it makes you wonder what else is different, right, Arun? Yeah, I'm sure quite a bit, actually. I mean, we always love to make these evolutionary connections here on the podcast and like covering a lot of these Evo Devo kind of stories. But even though, you know, we only have, I guess, a few millions of millions of years of evolution differing humans and, and rodents, tens of millions, I suppose, right? Um, the windows for gestation and the mechanisms of just gestation and reproduction are very different uh, between our species. And this is another paper that's alluding to that, um, dissecting some of these very early mechanisms of implantation and kind of, as you're alluding to, unraveling that black box or opening up that black box of implantation, especially when you're studying human implantation. Um, yeah, we're, we're more different than you might expect, but I guess it, it does make sense. We do know reproduction is inherently very different between mouse, mice, and humans, of course, right? Um, but anyways, yeah, this is another great model system coming from the Zernica Goats lab. First author here is uh, Bailey Weatherby, who I believe is in the, the UK portion of the lab in Cambridge over there. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just a, again, a reflection of the power of these model systems. Undoubtedly, these are going to be the highlight of ISSCR 2024. We've been covering so many of these papers here on the show. Um, Magdalena, of course, led off ISSCR 2023 as the very first speaker during the presidential keynote. Different Magdalena Goats, by the way, is leading off this year's ISSCR. They are not the same, just have a similar name. Um, but we're very, very excited to see more of these papers come out and to to cover them uh, as they do here on the show. And side note, just so happens that Jun Wu, the one and only Jun Wu, is here visiting here at Cedar. So I'm sure he's taking a look at this paper, and I can't wait to to hear about what he's doing in his lab. Yeah, I'm glad you you ended there because uh, I was just going to say, you know, I guess we're approaching 
a year, but we're not even really a year out from when the embryo models made a big splash. And of course, we've covered a lot of, I would say most of, uh, the higher profile papers that have come out employing the embryo models. But I, I'm just waiting for the uh, monumental wave, uh, both in this meeting and and to come. And looking at this story, it, it just really is so exciting to see all the new ways uh, that they're being applied and, and the questions uh, that they're able to address. And not even to mention yet, like you started to say the the why, like the difference, there's a lot of difference between human and, and mouse uh, It's manifest, right? It's clear. Uh, and some of these underlying molecular mechanisms may allow us to ask why and, and how that is. So why don't you hit up Jun Wu while you got him there, bend his ear a little bit on, on how he's applying these embryo models of what he's got in the works at one of the major journals, I'm sure, or multiple major journals with his output. Yeah, absolutely. He, like Magdalena, have been, they've, they've been both very productive in addition to Jacob Hanna and Nicholas Rubrone, who was also here at Cedars not too long ago. Um, just a really impressive array of researchers doing work in this area of Jun Wu, of course, is really uh, pioneering those blastoid structures, early blastoid models, but also has done some amazing, amazing stuff on chimerism and using cellular models to study uh, human animal chimeras. So I'm sure he's going to talk about that on his talk just happening in about an hour and a half from now. So that'll be that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, moving on to a paper from another icon in the field. This is coming from the lab of Elaine Fuchs. Um, amazing, amazing stem cell biologist, skin biologist over there at the Rockefeller University, uh, just around down the road from you. First author here is uh, Matthew Turney. This is a story in science about vitamin A, and it seems like we already knew everything there is to know about vitamin A and retinoic acid, right? But this is a um, an interesting story, just reflecting reflecting the importance of this particular molecule in lineage plasticity, or how stem cells, as we know, can go from one state to another, one fate to another. Um, this is really important in the skin. And we had Sherry Ger Cohen here on the show not too long ago, of course, Fuchs Lab Progeny. Um, she's had some amazing work in this area, dissecting um, fate commitment, and in particular, the lymphatic niche and its role in regulating skin regeneration and, and regulation. Uh, but here we're talking about vitamin A, um, in particular, retinoic acid, and how it's regulating lineage plasticity in the skin, the skin stem cells. And as we know, lineage plasticity is needed to actually release stem cells from their niche constraints and turn from one cell type to another, right? Uh, it's also important in the skin to direct them into the tissue compartments where they're actually most needed, whether it's in the case of regeneration or regulation. And here, you know, this work coming from the Fuchs lab, I'm sure many years in the works, there's a lot of amazing imaging here, just like in Sherry Cohen's story, amazing, amazing imaging coming from the Fuchs lab. So here they're showing that um, by using some of these really intricate imaging modalities, they, that skin stem cells can't effectively generate each lineage in vitro or regrow hair uh, and, and repair wounded epidermis in vivo without this regulation by vitamin A. So vitamin A is this really hinge point that's regulating this uh, regeneration process in the skin, and they uh, uncovered that retinoic acid is a critical, critical regulator of this process, retinoic acid, vitamin A, right? Um, so just combining a bunch of high throughput pro approaches, cell culture approaches, in vivo mouse genetics, they took it apart. They dissected the role of retinoic acid in tissue regeneration and found that retinoic acid, it's actually made, intrinsically made in hair follicle stem cell niches in vivo. Really cool. Again, in mice, and we'll have to see how they can extend this to, to humans as well. But the amount of vitamin A is actually critical for determining uh, cell lineage and cell identity as well. And I think there's a lot of implications here for hair growth. That's an obvious translational example here. Uh, wound repair and even implications for, for cancer, where, of course, lineage plasticity is really important in terms of determining an oncogenic state versus a quiescent state. Um, so, you know, just looking at the, just looking at the data here, really, I think the workhorse here is the imaging, you know, and, and that's one of the things that's always astounded me about the Fuchs lab is no matter what paper 
comes out of that lab, whether it's Stuart or Cohen's papers, whether it's the this paper from Matt Cerny, um, the imaging is really driving the discovery in, in their lab. And I think, you know, to get to the bottom of some of these state transitions, fate transitions and 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 the role of the the niche, you have to use that incredible high resolution imaging to do that. Um, in addition to, of course, a lot of single cell and, you know, one thing that I thought was unique here about this paper and that I hadn't seen as much in other Fuchs lab papers was the high throughput screen that actually ultimately uncovered retinoic acid as this hinge point for linear specification. Um, so, you know, really neat study. Uh, I think part of the reason it's in science is because it's, you know, this hinge point in retinoic acid uh, could be a therapeutic target, a very obvious therapeutic target for all these applications ranging from cosmetic to hair growth, I could use more of that, um, all the way to cancer, you know, potential uh, cancer therapeutics as well, and thinking about regeneration in the skin too. So a lot to think about here, but, you know, all coming down to the importance of retinoic acid in its role in lineage plasticity. Yeah, I mean, retinoic acid is, is prominent in a lot of uh, systems, a lot of tissues, most notably hematopoietic is where it's most familiar to me. Um, so yeah, something that's been considered uh, in a lot of different contexts, so druggable for sure. Um, and I, Arun, I'm looking at you here in the Zoom, glowing with a full head of hair. I don't know that you need any help, buddy, but the other guy in the Zoom, maybe, and put me in line for this. But uh, you know, you said it, uh, Elaine Fuchs, here, here we go again. Uh, after all these years, we just finished talking about uh, the human embryo models kind of kicked open the door and there's going to be paper after paper after paper that's going to be enabled by just a brand new platform. And, and there's Dr. Fuchs cranking in the skin using a set, essentially the same model system with the same uh, type of approach, but incorporating the new reporters, uh, incorporating the new technology with the single cell, et cetera, the imaging, all those stuff you talked about there. But, but more than anything, the deep, deep well of knowledge that she's built over many decades, uh, it's really no surprise that the the people that that do this science, they're not just like one-off scientists, instruments uh, of Elaine's will. Uh, they learn how to become amazing scientists like she is. Uh, I would love to know that recipe and then go on to create a whole new world of science of their own. And, and there's Elaine, cranking with the same system, uh, new toys with the same system. Kudos to her, a real testament to, to what a, a great mind uh, and the role of a, a great mind in, in conducting science with rigor uh, to further our collective knowledge. Hats off to you, Dr. Fuchs. Yeah, absolutely. It's a prolific lab in more ways than one, prolific in just in terms of the papers they put out, but also prolific in the, the lineage, right? You're talking about lineage here, but we're talking about scientific lineage. Elaine, of course, has a huge number of trainees, Sherger Cohen, like I mentioned, we just had here on the show, but various others who have taken prominent roles in the stem cell world. So very exciting. And I think the other thing to mention here is just diving a little bit deeper into the the mechanism here. Um, you know, there's more to it than that. Oh, this is a high through high throughput screen that uncovered retinoic acid as this hinge point regulator of lineage plasticity. They really teased it apart and figured out that uh, there's a whole regulatory network that's involved in this and implicating this pioneer's factor in SOX9, also known to upregulate the hair follicle genes while silencing epidermal fates. Um, also showed that WINT and BMP signaling has an important role here in orchestrating the distinct lineages that you need to make hair follicles. Um, but yeah, ultimately upstream of all of that is this vitamin A retinoic acid. Yeah, well, talking about the skin, you know, the skin, we appreciate it as this single organ, although perhaps the largest organ, you know, given the surface area. It's actually a lot of different little micro tissues, I would say, or I don't know, there's some nuance, right? The skin on the palm of your hand versus the back of your hand, for example, to put it simply. Um, and I got a story that's kind of along the same lines, although we don't appreciate it maybe as such. Uh, we ought to. The heart, you know, the heart, uh, we talk about the chambers, the atria, the ventricle, et cetera, right? Um, but, you know, in reality, the formation of the heart is the assemblage of these different components into a single coordinated 
bioengineering marvel, right? Um, and it's made out of, of these complex cardiac structures. Uh, and this is the first process, right? Uh, we talk about early embryo modeling, but you know, in terms of tissues and organs, the heart is like the first thing and the first beat of the heart, it's the first breath of life, all that. Um, a lot of us have seen it under the scope looking at these cells, but it's also accounts for most birth defects, right? Are the structural uh, defects in heart development. Also, structural heart uh, diseases in adults like hypertrophic cardiomyopathies and valvulopathies uh, all stem from dysfunction in the organization of the heart. Uh, but it, not really well understood how these different components of the heart interact and organize to form the whole. Uh, so in this, a pretty just, you know, they just went for it. Kwan Zhu and Neil Chi, uh, who are at UC San Diego, they did this pretty massive combo study using single cell RNA-seq combined with uh, multiplex air robust fluorescence in situ, otherwise known as MRFish, which is developed by Zhao Wei Zhuang at Harvard almost a decade ago now, which shows, you know, what an amazing tech, how widely it's been applied here. They're, they're using it to look at human hearts, okay? Here, again, underscoring the need as we approach the ISSCR for protections on human fetal research. You know, we still need this stuff, guys. Uh, we talk about embryo models, but and organoids, but still working with the real thing here. Uh, in this case, they're doing RNA-seq in the MRFish on the human hearts uh, and showed uh, the approach was so robust that they showed there was a bunch of cell lineages uh, involved in the organization of these cellular communities, they call them, to denote the different structures of the heart. And these are populations that were previously hadn't been characterized, the subtle differences between them. And uh, more than that, they looked into signaling pathways that coordinated the signaling between these two, these neighborhoods. Um, you know, this idea of, of these specific uh, cellular structures evolving from the cellular ecosystem in, within which they reside. So the signaling relationship between them uh, and showed that, uh, and here's where it was a stem cell story. They use these in conditional mouse models, but also human uh, pluripotent stem cells um, and showed that there was a role for this plexin semaphorin um, interaction during ventricular wall morphogenesis. So uh, this was like a brute force study, a, a nature story. I should have mentioned before the Magdalena Zernica goat story is a nature cell biology story. This is a nature story, I think, based on the fact that this is human material, feed of material, really hard to work with, very precious, um, and also getting a window into these critical stages and identifying, I think, a, a new, I don't know, a new concept, but I think really... Uh, overlaying a kind of single cell resolution on this idea of these cellular neighborhoods and attaching this idea of the, the kind of niche derived cues that dictate the subtle, subtle differences in the identity of those cells based on their location in the anatomy of the heart. Um, and what it really says to me at the end of the day is holy camoli. Uh, it's a miracle that there aren't more heart defects. Uh, the, 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 that first process is really super complex um, and, you know, error prone, I would say. It's not surprising when you look at the molecular biology and cell biology underlying it. Yeah, I think there's a lot we need to still learn about the heart, but this is one of those atlas stories and these come out every once in a while. There have been some other heart atlas stories recently as well. In fact, my former lab in Boston, the Seidman lab, um, they put together a, a com similar single cell heart atlas in the context of disease. This is more looking at a development, developmental atlas, right? But I do like how they framed it here, um, looking at cell communities. And thinking about the heart, you know, a lot of folks who don't work with the heart, they just assume that it's literally just a bunch of cardiomyocytes and just a bunch of muscle cells that are just contracting, but it's way more complicated than that. And actually the, the last roundup story that I'm going to get to in a little bit is actually teasing apart one of those subpopulations of myocytes that's found in the heart. So the heart, yeah, it's not just cardiomyocytes, but there's a whole array, you know, dozens of different cell types and subcell types that are 
so intricately responsible for the proper function, conduction, uh, various functions of the heart, right? Um, and, and I think there's there's basically two dimensions of the story, and, and this is why, in my mind, it's well, uh, probably three parts. There's three reasons in my mind why this became a nature story. One, as you're alluding to, it's just so hard to get these samples in the first place, and I can't imagine how long it actually took to to get all these tissues, uh, human tissues as well, right? Two is the the single cell part of it, which is the um, obviously the transcriptomic analysis of the cells in these various tissues. But three. And I think I also really encourage you to take a look at some of the videos in this associated with the study. Three is the uh, the spatial temporal component of the study, right? So not just doing the single cell, which you know we can all do single cell now, but using this murfish to bring a, a uh, spatial resolution to that, right, and be able to map um, in. I don't know, in, in 3D, where this transcriptomic, transcriptomic activity is actually coming from in the, the cell, in the architecture of the heart. So that's part of it, right? Doing the single cell, doing the transcriptomics, but also being able to maintain that architecture and the locations of where those transcriptomic signals is coming from. That's the real power of this Murfish technology. So yeah, hopefully this is a, a use, useful atlas for myself and other folks who are working in this space. Yeah, an atlas study, as you said, but yeah, bring the, the spatial component and get ready, right? Because uh, I know Murphy's has been around for approaching a decade now, but the spatial transcriptomics unbiased analysis there, you know, I know 10x chromium, they had the 50 micron resolution. And now I just saw they came out with this HD, they call it a high definition uh, arrays, whatever it is where the resolution is two microns a rune, which if, if that's legit, really changes the game. Uh, I messed around with the 50 micron resolution. It didn't, it didn't do it for me, but the two micron would make all the difference. Although I should also add that I got an email a couple of days ago from 10X being like, hey guys, get ready. We love science, but we're filing a bunch of lawsuits to protect our patents. So I'm <laughs> hoping... That that's not gonna gonna sure you know put put a little bit of a, a pinch on supply. Let's hope, but um, clearly they got something to fight for with this new tech. So I'm getting ready for a wave of spatial stories, Arun, and this is I think emblematic of of the utility and power of those. Yeah, and hey, maybe you'll be putting out some of these stories not too long from now, right? You always talk about how you're so involved in the the single cell, and I haven't seen you come out with a story at the make, just make a big splash day on come on we're i want to cover your story here on the show next week you know no, no pressure. pressure no pressure you got to publish in a week right no pressure um anyways talking about the heart and the last paper in the roundup is you know again also about the heart and also talking about the the subtypes of cells found in the heart this is a cell stem cell story that's actually using single cell analysis to um to drive forward the differentiation of a unique subtype of cells found in the heart that's involved in the proper electrical conduction of the heart. So this is a um, this is a paper coming from G. Ren over there in um, the Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases in Xiamen Cardiovascular Hospital in Xiamen University in China in, in Fujian, China. The title of the paper is "Canonical Wind Signaling Drives the Generation of Functional Human Pluripotent Stem Cell Derived Atrioventricular Canal Cardiomyocytes." Um, in bioprinted cardiac tissue. So it's a mouthful, but basically what, in a nutshell, what they're doing is they're just making this uh, important subpopulation of AV canal, atrioventricular canal cardiomyocytes um, from pluripotent stem cells. And from what I've seen as somebody who sort of works in this area, I haven't really seen the subpopulation of cells um, described, in, at least in differentiation protocols. They're probably in there somewhere. It's like whenever you do a generic cardiac differentiation, there's a all sorts of associated cells in there, whether it's the ventricular myocytes, atrial myocytes, fibroblasts, whatever, but probably there's some atrioventricular canal cardiomyocytes in there too. Maybe the population of cells is, or the percentage of cells in that population is pretty low. But here they're kind of uh, directing the differentiation of those cells a little bit more. So, you know, we talk about like bioprinting hearts. <laughs> That's something to dream about. It's sort of science fiction. Can you just bioprint a heart uh, for somebody after they have a heart attack and just you know swap out the old heart with a bioprinted one. Easier said than done. And we're still a long ways away from from getting there. I think that the stop gap is going to be some of those xenotransplanted hearts, you know, before we actually get a true bioprinted heart. But anyways, you know, that's something that folks 
feel like the ones here are striving for. Um, and part of the reason why it's been so hard to create a bioprinted heart in contrast to something that more simple like a bioprinted bladder or trachea is that we don't have all the cell types as I'm getting at, right? And in particular, we have we don't have these atrioventricular canal cardiomyocyte subtypes, and then their differentiation hasn't been well described yet. And what's so important about these cells? They're needed to actually slow down the electrical impulse between between the different parts of the heart, namely the atrium and the ventricle. Um, what they did here is they use a bunch of single cell RNA sequencing and 3D bioprinting as well to, to discover that you need a stage-specific activation of wind signaling to create these functional ABC cardiomyocytes. And maybe that's not too surprising because wind signaling is, of course, really important for, for these differentiation protocols. In fact, I use modulation of wind signaling to make cardiomyocytes in my own lab. Um, but it's about the timing and the, the way they modulated the timing was ultimately how they were able to get these uh, functional ABC cardiomyocytes made from pluripotent stem cells. And they characterize them. They, of course, you know, anytime you do a new differentiation protocol, you got to characterize the cells you're making. Um, they had uh, the typical morphological characteristics and the right molecular markers associated with these ABC cardiomyocytes, including the TBX2 and MSX2 transcription factors. And then the other part of this, which I think elevated this ultimately to a cell stem cell paper, was the bioprinting. So they did some really cool bioprinting in prefabricated cardiac tissues. And in their words, made, they made something called a bow tie, a cardiac bow tie, where they have like um, the atrioventricular canal cardiomyocytes basically sandwiched in between two lobes of like other standard ventricular cardiomyocytes. And we're actually able to show that the presence of those ABC cardiomyocytes in vitro um, can successfully delay the electrical impulse propagating from the different aspects of the cardiomyocytes, which is really cool. So they're functionally and transcriptomically, these it looks like these cells are doing what they're supposed to be doing, so, which is great. Um, and ultimately, they're, again, showing that they have a new differentiation protocol. Even in this uh, the year of our Lord, 2024, we still have new differentiation protocols coming out. Um, which is great. And, um, you know, the, hopefully this is a, a unique uh, cell population that can be used for additional potentially cardiac bioprinting approaches, um, and maybe even for drug screening and disease, drug screening and disease modeling as well, because there are certain uh, drug compounds and certain diseases that specifically affect this subtype of cells found in the heart, the atrioventricular canal cardiomyocytes. Um, so yeah, you know, another great story coming out here in cell stem cell cardiac specific. I feel like I haven't covered a lot of cardiac specific stories uh, lately here on the show. Maybe I've intentionally trying to not do that, trying to get out of my comfort zone a little bit, but here I am coming back to my comfort zone. Back to the heart of the matter. Arun, I mean, let me just, I gotta, I gotta take a step back here for a second and review. Do you mean to tell me that human pluripotent stem cells can be differentiated to a cardiac subtype by modulating wind signaling? Amazing, right? Are Amazing. Insane. Um, no, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, make too much light of this because as you said, it, it is a stage. Um, part of me, when I read the, the title of the paper, I was like scratching my head a little bit. I was like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like in this, the year of our Lord 2024, you can still get a, a cell stem cell paper with a diff protocol. But, um, then I read it and I was like, all right, all right, all right. Pretty amazing. And I, I think the, the, the key there, as you uh, you know, addressed it all better than I could, um, but I'll just finish with the the bioprinting thing. I think that was a key element there, uh, that they got these to take you know on a form in a structured way that was controllable, reproducible, um, and make these bow ties, of course. And as you would expect, you know, it's a lot to do a new diff, and then they do the bioprinting, and so the bow ties are like, yeah, they do the thing but they're not as good as you would expect in the adult human heart. Of course, you can attribute that to like the lack of maturation or whatever it may be. Um, and that brings me to, I think, the second point, which is that the, the, when you combine you know, this, you get all the cell types you can get. You have all the diff protocols, you got the timing right, you have a, a method for bioprinting that's reproducible and precise, uh, and then you incorporate all the knowledge from like the first story with the cellular neighborhoods. 
And as we get the more refined tissue, I don't know, maybe at some point get some kind of vascular conduction surrogate. I guess that's the big, big obstacle that needs to be overcome. But when I see all these stories come, I'm not so, so uh, I guess, you know, demoralized or disappointed with the result at the end when they're like, yeah, well, it's not as good as the adult human art, or it, it, it doesn't do this or it doesn't do that. Because I think that, uh, you know, another brick in the wall and the totality of all these stories, once we've we've addressed all these problems and they've become kind of commonplace uh, and, and standard, these protocols, I think we're going to be able to put them together to, I don't know about make a human heart, but to make some kind of patches, to make some tissues that may function in a therapeutic landscape, which I, I'll be frank and honest. I had a low point probably about five years ago maybe even like two years ago, Arun, if I'm being honest, where I was like the human heart, never. We're never going to make a therapy that's going to be a cell-based surrogate for cardiac function. So uh, there, you know, I've outed myself. I was a real naysayer, but I'm coming back around, Arun. Hey, you know, just a couple of naysayers talking to each other right now, right? You know what I mean? But I, I'm kind of agree. With, I sort of agree with you. And part of it is because we've been in this field for so long, and in particular the cardiac field, that perhaps we're a little bit jaded and cynical about the downstream applications. I, I personally think, and we're just kind of talking off the cuff about what's going to get there first. I think it's going to be the xenotransplanted stuff. And it's already the furthest along, right? You already have these genetically modified pig hearts going into people in clinical trials and some applications where these folks have been alive for more than a month, right? Um, I think the iPS cell therapy, especially for cardiac, uh, we've talked about it a ton here on the show. There's limitations with immaturity, electrophysiological, whatever mismatch and all that, but folks are working on it and I'm sure it's it's going to catch up. But I, and if I had to put a bet out there, it's going to be the xenotransplanted stuff because it's just so far ahead. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I'm 100% with you. And that is not at all to take away from the tremendous value that this and all the tools are going to have for modeling and for talks, all that. So yeah, no shade, just like, I mean, I for, for a minute there was inspired that we were going to be making hearts in a dish. And then you brought me back down to earth with the question of why would we do that when we can make them in pigs? Anyway, moving <laughs> on to the interview, some things maybe we can talk with, about with our three guests uh, today, which is a special treat. But before we get there, a uh, quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. Arun and I have been taking turns co-hosting a brand new podcast. Yes, we've been cheating on the Stem Cell podcast just a bit, just a bit. It's called the Lab Coats and Life podcast, and it's about soft skills and helping people progress in science-based careers. In celebration of the launch, you can also enter to win a free lab coat. Visit stemcell.com slash lab coat contest to enter to win by March 27. All right, you guys, this is probably... I would say one of my favorite episodes of the year because the guests are outstanding, of course, but more for what it means. It means we're getting close to the summer. We're getting close to the ISSCR annual meeting, which is, of course, my favorite meeting of the year. I'm sure I'm not alone there. Uh, today, we have the leadership of the ISSCR here to share some thoughts and insights with you. Uh, starting with the current president of the ISSCR, we have Dr. Amanda Clark, who's a founding director of the UCLA Center for Reproductive Science, Health, and Education, also professor of molecular cell and developmental biology there at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Clark is an internationally recognized leader in stem cell biology whose research focuses on germline cells, which are the cells that create eggs and sperm. Results from her research could lead to new methods for reproductive care to treat infertility, a global health issue that affects approximately one in six adults worldwide. We also have Dr. Agneta Kirkaby, who is the chair of the ISSCR program committee, also uh, associate professor and group leader at the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Stem Cell Biology, also known as RENU at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, Dr. Kirkaby's group applies advanced human stem cell models to understand how hundreds of human neuronal subtypes are formed during embryo development. 
And finally, uh, we have Dr. Malin Parma, who is the chair of the ISSCR Program Committee, uh, also a New York Stem Cell Foundation uh, Robertson investigator. Uh, she's at the University of Lund, where her research aims to understand cell fate specification in the developing brain and in human neural progenitor cells using cell-based models of neuronal differentiation. Amanda, Agneta, Malin, thank you guys so much for joining us on this special episode. Delighted to be here. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Like they all said, of course, our favorite time of the year here on the show. I mean, we get to chat with all of you. This is exciting. Um, we did something like this similar late last year and hoping to do it again in the future. And really it's, you know, ISSER annual meeting is my favorite meeting of the year. It's been my favorite meeting for many years now. I've been going there ever since I was a grad student. And I mean, Dalon's been going there longer than I have. Um, every year the meeting has shown a lot of growth and every year seems to be a little bit different, different flavors, so to speak, with things definitely get a, getting a bit more translationally and clinically oriented as of late. So really before we dive into the, the nitty gritty details, um, I was hoping if each of you could give us an overview of what scientists can hope to expect at this year's version of the annual meeting and what's so special about it this year in particular. So Dr. Parmer, as the, the head of the, the program committee, do you think you could start us off? Yeah, I think this year we can look forward to a great meeting, almost like every year with ISSR. But what's special, I think, is, uh, well, one of the things that are very special for me is that stem cell uh, therapies are actually coming to uh, realization in clinical trials. And I think this year we have the most uh, talks and focus sessions on translational stem cell biology. So it's fan fantastic to see how the all the work that's been conducted with stem cell research over the years have now actually reached uh, patient and patient benefit. So that's something that's going to be really nice uh, to showcase. And I'm also very excited about the all the spots that we have for young scientists. Uh, we have speaker slots from the um, abstract submissions. We have the focus sessions. So I think it's going to be a, a great meeting uh, also in that sense. And of course, happy to be in Europe. Absolutely. Dr. Clark, what do you think? Oh, I'm really excited about this meeting. It's been 10 years since the ISS has held their annual meeting in Europe. Uh, the last time I was at that meeting in Europe, that was in Stockholm, and that was an absolutely fantastic meeting. And I'm expecting the same thing from Hamburg as well. So the location is really exciting to me. The science is going to be spectacular, but the location is going to be equally as good. How about you, Dr. Triggerby? Yeah, I'm, of course, also hugely excited. It's going to be in Europe again. I think we in Europe have really been <laughs> missing the ASSCR meeting. Last time was in 2015, and because of the pandemic, it was really pushed several years. And uh, um, I was informed today, actually, that the meeting in Stockholm was the largest meeting ever, the largest ISSCR meeting ever. And the uh, we're almost re reaching record heights with the number of abstract submissions and uh, registered participants already. So I think it's very clear that people have really been waiting for this uh, meeting in Europe. So, and as Malin says, we have a lot of uh, clinical focus and a lot of sessions and talks about products that are either in clinical trial or getting close to clinical trial. And I think that's very, very exciting. Super exciting. I mean, we're all excited. We've said it. I think uh, Stockholm is going to have to step aside. This might be peak ISSCR to date. I think we're all coming back uh, and excited. You know, the U.S. meetings are great, but Europe, Europe is Europe, uh, as you guys have all alluded to. Uh, and it's a big deal. I mean, the ISSCR annual meeting is a big deal baseline, right? Not just among scientists, physicians, engineers, etc. All the people have devoted their careers to the investigation, application uh, of stem cells and stem cell-based technologies. Um, but the, the science that's unveiled at this annual meeting often makes headlines in the general public, like last year when talks related to human embryo models were shared uh, and stirred up quite a, a bit of news and, and social media uh, you know, a big stir. There was a lot of, lot of discussion, a lot of debate. Um, but I think, you know, we've all, I think, learned at this point that the media frenzy can, can you know, a sword with two, two, two uh, double-edged sword. That's the one I'm looking for. A lot of unintended consequences. Um, and recently, there have been these incursions uh, by political actors on, on 
women's reproductive rights, this whole idea of like embryo personhood in Alabama, stark reminders of how science impacts policy and vice versa. Um, how does the ISSCR leadership ensure that the society's policies, the ISSCR's policies, are, are keeping pace with the scientific possibilities while also balancing the sometimes diverse perspectives of like a, a global scientific community that you know coexists with a lot of different societal norms and mores. Uh, how do you guys stay up to date, so to speak, in terms of policy at ISSCR? Well, ISSCR has a number of committees and these committees are made up of the membership of the ISSCR. And one of the committees is the policy committee and the chair of that committee is one of the past presidents, Sean Morrison. And they're very active uh, in evaluating how uh, the science and the policy interact with each other. Uh, and also anticipating new policies that might be emerging that will impact stem cell science so that the ISSCR can get out ahead of this. So the policy committee is very active. Uh, a companion committee to the policy committee is the ethics committee. And that also, again, is made up of ISSCR membership. And the ethics committee is integral to the work that we do as stem cell scientists and thinking about the ethics of stem cells in basic research and also in translation. Hmm. Yeah, Ma Malin and Agnete, you guys are trailblazers in terms of like clinical translation, which is hugely regulated, uh, you know, on a, on a much more real level. Um, what do you have to say about that interaction of, of policy and science in the clinical space and trying to adapt the science to meet, you know, all the demands and rigor of, of the more advanced clinical trials? Yeah, I think this is important both for experimental uh, research and for clinical trials. And I've been working both on uh, human fetal tissue and human embryonic stem cells, both uh, in uh, experimental research and in translational science. And it says stem cells, it's inherent that the stem cell field is at the forefront of medical developments. So at the forefront, you need to work together with medical ethicists, you need to work together with society and patient organizations and form uh, the landscape moving ahead. So we're not walking into something uh, that is pre-formed or pre-decided. We're at the boundary, but as we're pushing this boundary, uh, we need to do this together as a community. And I think this is one of the great things about ISSCR and the ethics and the policy committee is that we really work together to bring these therapies uh, to society in in a manner that's where we take it all aspects into consideration, including the ethics and availability of these therapies. Mm -hmm. Another um, part of being in the front line of research is maybe Agneta want to speak a little bit about uh, our clinical trials on pluripotent stem cells because we're in the same um, kind of space with the regulatory agencies that we're kind of pushing the front forward and we need to work together with, with the re regulatory agencies. Agneta, do you want to fill in on that? Um, yeah, and we actually have some some uh, sessions, quite a few sessions, but they're both focus sessions and spotlight sessions focusing on manufacturing, for instance, and regulatory requirements for going into clinical trials, but also ethics around clinical trials. And I think these are things that have been much less focused on uh, in previous years because people just haven't been, been ready to discuss that. But now several products are ready for clinical trial, and these uh, issues become much more relevant for the community as a whole. So I think it's great that ISSCR is a place where these things can be brought up and actually discussed um, together. Yeah, honestly, it's one of my favorite things about being a stem cell biologist is that, you know, not a whole lot of fields get to ask questions like this and have discussions like this outside of the immediate science, you know, where there's so much more to talk about as opposed to just the nitty, nitty gritty technical details of the science. And perhaps this is just a reflection of how globally important this field has become is that folks outside of the science are getting interested in the science. That's, I think that's a net positive. So, you know, shifting gears a little bit, uh, we've talked a little bit about how Hamburg is this year's amazing choice for the annual meeting, the biggest stem cell event of the year, right? I mean, it's been a few years since the annual meeting, as we've talked about, was held in a non-U.S. location, in part because of COVID and how things went virtually over the last few years. I mean, I think last time it was held internationally was in Melbourne. Um, so, you know, Hamburg is a fun city to, to be in. Uh, I'm just curious your thoughts about 
what you're so excited about for, for Hamburg, what you're hoping to experience in the city, and why do you think this is a great place to have the biggest stem cell event of the year? Why don't you get us started, Dr. Kirkby? Well, I love Hamburg. Actually, our lab went to Hamburg for our lab retreat <laughs> last year. So uh, I really love that city. Um, and of course, while I haven't been involved in the choice of Hamburg for the ISSCR, I'm looking forward uh, to it. It's a nice city. It has lots of water, lots of old, beautiful building. It has this very funny place you can visit where it's just called the Miniature Wonderland, which is like a huge, um, like a little model train um set up where you have like <laughs> train small mini trains that are going around the whole building through uh, landscapes and over mountains and through tunnels and into cities and you can push buttons and lights turn on <laughs> and it's, it's it's actually it is actually the number one tourist attraction in Hamburg and <laughs> I've been there every time I've been in Hamburg so I can recommend people to go there um, and I can maybe also just say, which if people are not aware, that Hamburg is uh, one of the sites of the uh, Football World Cup this year. And this is the reason the ISSCR meeting has been pushed to July. So if someone is keen on watching some of the uh, uh, football matches, they could actually uh, put that tag that on to the ISSCR meeting and do both at the same time. Oh, man. Hamburg is going to be off the chain. I, I talked to Daniel, but this is a special message for Daniel Besser, if you're listening out there. I know you've been waiting for this meeting for near on a decade. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but you know, there's what's become colloquially known as the German party every year at the ISSCR. And I'm really looking forward for the German party in Hamburg. Like I said, off the chain. I mean, uh, we got to watch out. We got to watch out. Be in our best behavior. Daniel Besser, this one's for you. Uh, but as we're saying, you know, the last time uh, we've all said, the last time uh, the meeting was held in Europe uh, is almost a decade, 2015 in Stockholm. It was one of my favorites uh, because specifically I was able to append a couple days in Iceland onto the front end of that trip. You know, you can do that lay layover thing with Iceland Air. That was a an amazing experience. Uh, but just to take you back, Rudy Yanish was president, uh, a guy we know now as Paul Tizar. I always called him Paul uh, Tizar. Uh, he got the Young Investigator Award that year. Um, the Travel Awards, got to talk about the Travel Awards that year. There was someone by the name of Agneta Kirkaby from the lab of Malin Parma, <laughs> uh, who was presenting her work on modeling human neural tube anatomy through culturing of stem cells under microfluidic gradients way ahead of her time. Uh, that was in the Saturday Saturday concurrent. I remember that like it, it was yesterday. Um, and, and the final plenary here, getting to the question, was uh, making tissues in organs. Uh, and that had Deepak talking about cardiac reprogramming. Remember that? Amy Wagers with her aging story. Uh, Masayo Takahashi with the IPS-based retinal therapies. Bob Langer, of course, talking about a couple of his more than 1,400 patents. So a lot has changed. I mean, that lineup, uh, there's been a lot of changes in, in the, the therapeutic landscape, the scientific landscape. Um, then again, some things don't change. Bob Langer let off. He was at the front end of the 2023 plenary. So it's all it's Langer all the time. Um, but I'll put it to you guys. What, what do you think of the biggest difference is in the society uh, over the last decade? The biggest changes. In, and on the other side of that, um, what has the society been able to preserve uh, in the face of such monumental growth, both in the scientific uh, as well as societal landscape? So uh, just a couple of questions there. Let's start with, with, with you, uh, Amanda. What, what, what do you think are some of the biggest differences in the society and the landscape? Well, clearly, as Marlon talked about in the beginning, the field has matured over this last decade and and become more translational in its focus, which is a natural evolution of the basic science uh, starting to move towards uh, uh, therapies that have the potential to, to help the lives of humankind. And I think that that's an incredible um, activity that the ISSCR does. But what I'm also thrilled about with the, the ISSCR, and this is a constant tension, so something that we think a lot about, is balancing 
this incredible basic science and the basic science pipeline and the early career investigators that are coming into the field, often beginning with basic science questions and projects, and then those begin to mature towards uh, towards clinical translation. So balance, being able to balance in programs, um, excellent basic science, fundamental science, uh, but also the excitement and the potential of where this research goes uh, in the clinic is, is something that I think ISSER does very well, but it's a, but it's a constant and delicate balance. Hmm. Yeah, Marlon, how about you? I mean, as a as a PI who sent your postdoc in 2015, you know, speaking to that as a, as a stage, right, for for young postdocs to be seen to share their science, and here we are now with uh, Agnata running amazing trials and doing amazing science in her own group. So, like that, to me, has always been one of the the major elements of ISSCR is where you go and you and you see all the people you know, that are the, were before then just names on the papers. And you see all the people that really drive the work forward. Do you think that that stage has gotten so large that maybe it's difficult for the, the younger voices to to be integrated into the program? Mala, maybe you could speak to that. And Agnetta after, if you, if you like. Yeah, I don't think so. I think ISSR has always been a home for everyone. When I was a young scientist, I was welcomed into the community. Uh, and there was, uh, you could serve on committees. There was special... Uh, sessions uh, centered around the poster sessions. There's always been uh, the luncheons. There's always a place to engage. And as you then uh, grow older and get more into your circles or your field, there's also space for you to interact. So I think that hasn't changed about ISSR. It's always been a very inclusive society. There's always been um, efforts to include everyone from uh, early trainees, PhD students, all the way up to the professors that are have been in the game for like 40 years. So, so, so that's one of the things that I love about the ISSR. And this year, like the other years, we always make sure that we have um, young scientists presenting uh, at the plenary and concurrent sessions. Um, we also have travel grants to try to get even more postdocs and students to come. Uh, we have the science spotlight session. That's actually another way to promote the PhD students and postdocs. So, so I think it, it's a great society. It's welcoming and everyone at every level uh, has a place here. Yeah, uh, I'll just follow up and I say I, I totally agree to that. I've also been part of both reviewing abstracts and selecting abstracts from some years now. And the abstracts are really selected based on novelty and interest by the reviewers, not by the track record of the person submitting the abstract. So you can have just as good chance of having your abstract selected if you're a PhD student as if you're a PI, if just your research is interesting enough. And that's what we're going to see in all the concurrent ses sessions. We're going to have several um, selected abstract speakers. Um, and as Malin alluded to, the travel award budget has actually been increased this year by 40% with the purpose of attracting even more young students and postdocs to the meetings. I think that's excellent. This is a good time to get a note in, guys, that late breaking abstracts, you got to get those in by April 3rd. All right. So as soon as you hear this episode, get your science down on paper and get it in there. It's a great meeting. And, and as you just heard, uh, great ideas uh, get showcased at this meeting. Yeah, that's a huge deal. Thank you for that initiative. That's going to be a make a big deal for a lot of folks from around the world, for sure. Uh, Dr. Parmer, you actually mentioned something new that's happening this year. This is the Science Spotlight Sessions. I mean, this is really cool. It's a community-driven event, sort of series of sessions that is organized by postdocs and grad students. I mean, it'll be presented as part of the scientific program. And there's a broad range of topics that are actually being covered here, like mechanical transduction and differentiation, translation and academic research, obviously very relevant. Innovation and cultured meat, that's pretty cool. That's that's unique. Um, and also frontiers and epigenetic editing of stem cells. Could you talk a little bit about these new initiatives, these science spotlight sessions, um, and why you're so excited to have them this year? Yeah, both because what you said, it, it's a way to engage uh, students and postdocs, not just in uh, speaking at the sessions, but actually organizing sessions. Another way is that there's room for topics that just didn't fit into the main schedule. So as you say, stem cell science and meat uh, will be a fantastic uh, session to go to. So it's a way to expand and highlight research areas that are uh, emerging fields or very specific technologies that drive the field forward. 
um, that there's no room for in the plenary or concurrent session. So, so it's both a way to to expand the the interaction with the young community, but also to really see what are the what are the new and uh, interesting uh, things moving in the field. And because it is, they are uh, organized and applied for by uh, students and postdocs. You get kind of the newer, cooler stuff coming in there. So I think it's a great uh, addition to the meeting. So uh, talking about the plenary. Uh, the presidential plenary here, for me, it's the most exciting. I mean, I love all the science, but it's so exciting in, in my view um, because it's the first, right? It gets the show going. Uh, and also, I think by design, it has a way of demonstrating both the progress and momentum that has been built over recent history, you know, the last year or so, um, while also providing a glimpse of like the mind blowing capabilities that are within our collective grasp, right? I think last year that was really illustrated well by uh, Magdalena Zernica Goat's uh, talk about the human embryo model, which started a firestorm. I and mean, people were running out of the amphitheater there to get on the phone. Um, this year, we have a different Magdalena Goat, uh, also Tina Mukherjee, Catherine Plath, and Sarah Teichman. Uh, so Amanda, can you give us uh, an insight into your mind there, into your thinking in assembling this group? Well, first of all, I am so excited about this presidential plenary. Uh, Magdalena Goetz is a neuroscientist from Germany. And so I, it was really important to me to have um, a phenomenal scientist uh, who lives in Germany, who does her work in Germany. Uh, and so she'll be leading off our presidential plenary. Um, it was also really important for me to uh, have a, a developmental biologist as part of the plenary and an early career investigator. And so Tina Mukherjee is from India and she's from INSTEM. So having representation uh, from a different country than what perhaps is not normally represented in plenaries was also a, a really important part of um, putting together this program. And Tina's work in tissue stem cells is, is mind blowing. So get ready for that one. Uh, Catherine Plath is a good colleague of mine, phenomenal scientist, works with pluripotent stem cells, embryo models. Uh, she originally is from Germany. So again, so thinking back to a person who you know began their life in Germany and has now lives in the US and is, is one of the leading scientists in pluripotent stem cells. Um, and then Sarah Teichman from the UK. So another location as well, uh, talking about genomics. Her expertise is uh, genomics and stem cells and lineage differentiation with a focus on the immune system. So, so yeah, so this plenary is going to blow us all out of the water. And the other thing I want to mention too is, is not only is this science incredible, but we have incredible female scientists. And one thing that is really important to me is lifting up female scientists and giving them a platform where they can talk about the phenomenal work that they do. And so this, this uh, to me, this plenary hits all boxes. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, we're so excited about it. And, you know, like Dale was alluding to, this, this is important, right? This is the session that really gets everything going, gets the audience going. I mean, everybody is attending you know, they have the energy to attend first day, right? Sure. But the hall is going to be full. There's going to be thousands of people there. And part of this is really important for the trainees too. These are the iconic people in the field who are really driving it forward. And the trainees get to learn uh, about these iconic folks, these iconic scientists who are, uh, who typically they just read about in the papers, right? But now they potentially get to see them face to face and have these one-on-one -on -one interactions with them. That's so critically important to career development in my mind is, you know, meeting your heroes. And sometimes you have to do that in science. Um, as a, you know, trainee not too long ago, this was honestly the most important part of the meeting to me was the social part of it, being able to connect, not just with my heroes, but with my colleagues, my peers who are around the world doing amazing science as a cardiovascular biologist, you know, I, ISSCR has a huge um, realm and huge group of people in cardiovascular biology who are well represented. So it's just so important for me to meet all those folks. But, you know, this is important for career development. You might get your next job by going to ISSCR, for example, and there's networking hubs as well and job hubs too. So 
It's a, a really critical meeting for folks to attend in their early careers who are deciding on the career path, deciding to what, what to work on in the future. Um, and like we've talked about, ISCR has a lot of initiatives geared towards the early career folks like travel awards, merit awards, all these kind of things. But is there anything that we're missing when it comes to early career initiatives for ISCR 24? Uh, is there anything else worth highlighting there? Um, uh, Dr. Kirkaby, do you want to jump in? Well, I just want to highlight that there is a lot of support on young parents. So there are um, support awards for uh, childcare at home. There's also um, offered childcare at the meeting, uh, but also elder care, uh, support for elder care at home. So it, there is there are several opportunities even for um, people that are in a different stage uh, or in a difficult stage of their personal life together with the career that they can actually get support to make this happen. So I think that those initiatives are very good. Especially because if you're bringing your family to the meeting, which it sounds like we all should, because we need to go and see the the, the little miniature trains and take out families there, then then this does create opportunities to be able to to bring the family to Hamburg as well with you. So to attend the meeting and to bring the family to have it all, it's incredible. Absolutely agree, a hundred percent. As someone who is bringing my own family to Hamburg, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, to introduce uh, your kids to the science that's that's being done out there, that's all those dreams that we had being realized in their lifetime. Um, what a poetic thing to do. Uh, finally, for all three of you guys, I want to ask, what what is, you know, in summation, when you think about the ISSCR as a society, I think we're all really devoted to, um, what is it that the society means to you and what do you think your role is uh, in, in trying to push the mission forward? Let's start with you, Agneta. Well, uh, I'm of course very excited to see all the clinical applications uh, coming forward. And I'm personally very excited about the plenary clinical application sessions on the Saturday in the meeting. Uh, seeing what are we actually, I mean, we're at a point now where we're actually seeing data coming out from the patients and not just things getting close to phase one. Things are in phase one, getting close to phase two. We're seeing both efficacy data and safety data coming out of these trials. And there will be several examples of that showcased um, at the ISSCR this year. And I will be extremely excited to follow that. How about you, uh, Amanda? Uh, the ISSCR is so important to me. I was at the very first meeting in Boston over 20 years ago as a postdoc and have gone to almost every meeting since that time. And so I feel like I've grown up in the ISSCR, that my career has really been shaped by the ISSCR. And I really appreciate that ISSCR has a leadership role in uh, how stem cell research is regulated around the world, enabling stem cell scientists to do their work while giving assurances to the general public that the work is being done responsibly and ethically. So the society means so much to me, and I'm sure it means lots of different things to different people. I'm very excited about this meeting in Hamburg. It, it feels like the culmination of where we've gone over the last 20 years, um, and to have it back in Europe is, is just spectacular. Marlon? Yeah, to me, ISSR is the home away from home. And I love the science. I love the sessions. I love the poster sessions at ISSR and all the vibrant uh, discussions going on there. But I also love to go there and see all uh, friends uh, that I've known for so many years now. Uh, and uh, I mean, the ISSR is it's a fantastic, but also very tiring meeting. I usually, when, when it's in the US, uh, I get on that plane and I sleep the whole way home. Uh, <laughs> because it's been full of science, full of social events, activities. Um, and really, it's a place where we can all meet at the you know, very sharp, extreme science level, but also at the very personal level. And I think you need both. Yeah, agree. Uh, the point of the spear. And I, I mark the time uh, by the ISSCR meetings. I mean, I can remember that Stockholm meeting because I missed my second born's first birthday and I'm still getting heat about that. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so there'll be some uh, agreeable symmetry, perhaps, when I when I bring that little guy nine years later into Hamburg and, and show him show him what I missed his birthday for. I doubt he'll care one way or the other. But it's going to be a great time. Uh, I can't wait to see you guys there. And, you know, as you said, this is uh, where we all come together and geek out about science, stimulated to the max, and then pass out for about four days. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's what keeps us going. And I, I think, I don't think it's any exaggeration at all to say it's the biggest meeting of the year for all of us. So, um, looking forward to sharing that with you and, and really appreciate you guys sharing with us and our listeners, all your thoughts about this meeting and the society and about, uh, the, the four day span that we're going to spend, uh, come July, hopefully not getting too aggrieved by all that World Cup action, but uh, certainly going to be a good time. So thanks again for joining us, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very much fun. All right, everybody, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on X at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Getting really pumped over here in the Northeast Arun. Spring is coming and summer's right around the corner with the ISSCR. I can't wait, partner. It's going to be such a great time. Looking forward to seeing you there. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode with the leadership. Until the next time, thanks for listening.